I'm Ian Billy. And I am Michael Sheehan. Just this past weekend, we watched the Rectivit series, Yard Market Cross. We are going to recap that and then look ahead to this coming weekend cyclocross action when the UCI Cyclocross World Cup is going to resume in Tabor and the second installment of the DVV series is going to take to Ham, Belgium. Let's get into Yard Market Cross. The big storylines were in the elite. Women's field, at least for me, Katie Compton continues her strong run of form this season and the return of Lucinda Brand. Katie Compton, of course, was second to Lucinda at Yarn Market Cross. And I, I have some strong criticisms for Katie, which I would like to dole out. And I feel like we can dole out because she is having such a good year this year. Um, pretty much top 10 in every race she's done. The only race she has been outside of the top 10 since October was Copenberg Cross and five podium places, but she she can do better. She can be winning races. She's been close, but not close enough. Okay, let's hear your critiques. <laughs> I, so, I'm waiting. <laughs> so number one, Katie Compton needs to get better at her starts. This has been an ongoing theme with Katie for years now. I mean, we've seen her lose world championships because she is not getting off the line fast enough. But Yarn Market Cross was, to me, especially egregious. This was a strong field, but certainly not the strongest elite women's field we have seen this se season. None of the riders from the 777 team were there. And she was right on the front row but by the first turn, like 50 meters in, she was already hovering around the top 10. Um, Lucinda Brand charged off the front and Katie eventually got there, but it cost her a ton of energy. Um, I am not an expert on how to be good at uh, starting cycle cross races. I will put that out there, but Katie Compton is. She is a 15 time consecutive national champion. Um, she knows what she needs to do to get off the line quicker and she just needs to work on it. I think it's more complicated than that. It's not. Uh, it is. Well, Katie, Katie Compton is a diesel. That is what we know her as. She doesn't have the rapid acceleration that you need to get off the start line. You never see her making these blistering attacks. She just winds up the motor and when it gets going, it's really, really, really fast. And that's how she's able to catch up to riders like Lucinda Brand and beat them at the end sometimes because she is just so strong. But it takes her a while to get it going and that's just kind of been... Katie Compton for as long as I've been watching her race. I, I, I know this. I know that it's not within her uh, natural physical attributes to get off the line as quickly as other riders. But I think some of this also just comes down to um, positioning and handling and putting your handlebars in front of someone else's going into a turn and not grabbing brakes. Maybe just being a little bit more assertive, being a little bit more aggressive and fighting for that top position. I mean, um, losing 10 places in the first 50 meters is costing her wins. Um, but let's let's move on. I have another critique as well, and Can't it wait. comes it comes to pit decisions. She uh -huh. to me lost this race when she pitted about 30 minutes in with about three lap two and a half laps to go. She was actually leading Lucinda Brand at this at this point when she decided to veer a long ways outside of the line into the pit get a fresh bike. Lucinda Brand took the opportunity to attack her, put in a good 10 bike lengths, and Kitty Compton never was able to bring that back. And she ended up losing by about the same margin that she lost by taking that pit. Uh, Lucinda Brand only pitted once during this race early on, um, basically to adjust her tire pressure and then opted not to pit. I think from a tactical standpoint, Lucinda Brand did make the starter, the smarter decision and it, it was a big tactical error by Katie Compton on my book. That's fair, but let's get into Lucinda Brand because Lucinda Brand is back. She was second at the World Championships last year and Losing to Lucinda Brand is not a bad thing. She is 
one of the best, if not on her way to being the best female cyclocross racer in the world. No, this is definitely exciting to have Lucinda Brand back in the elite women's field. I mean, the elite women's field is, is so deep, has so much parity, and it just gets better as the season goes on. We're seeing Lucinda Brand back. Um, who knows if and when we'll see Marianne Voss. Uh, Pauline Ferrand Prevost would be amazing to be back in the fold. So yeah, it's exciting to have Lucinda back, um, somebody that is gonna challenge this dominant 7-7-7 team. Yeah, and I think that Lucinda is really just in a fantastic position to be able to do that with her new team, Telenet Fide Alliance. This is Lucinda Brand last year was on uh, Sunweb, which was a great program for her on the road, but it offered basically nothing to her in cyclocross. Now uh, Lucinda Brand is in the Trek family and she has a fantastic road team and cyclocross team behind her. And I am really hoping that uh, Sven Niss and this whole uh, Telenet Valois Lions uh, program can just give her infrastructure to, yeah, maybe go one step higher on the World Championship podium at the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, we saw at Worlds last year the thing that cost her was not having an expert mechanic in the pit. She actually had her dad, you know, working as her mechanic in the pit because she wasn't on a team that had a lot of infrastructure. Uh, there was a fumble in the pit that o allowed Santa Can to open up the gap to her. I cannot see that happening with, uh, you know, Telenet Bawa Lions in the fold. And yeah, uh, handling technical skill has been Lucinda Brand's Achilles heel as well. You know, we've seen some highlight reels of crashes, especially from Overicy in 2017 and 2018. And you've got to think that having Sven Nice, Warren Comers, and the Telenet team behind her helping her out is going to make a big difference. We saw Sven Nice uh, coaching her on from the sidelines at Yarmarket Cross. Yeah, uh, really good to see that and expecting big things from Lucinda Brandt as the season progresses. The fields are only getting more and more competitive. Let's go on to what we've got coming on up this weekend. First off this Saturday, it is the return of the UCI World Cup, it is the fourth round. It is being held in Tabor, Czech Republic. And leading the women's field is a Czech rider, Katarina Nash. Yeah, Nash had a really strong showing. Um, both in Iowa City and Waterloo, as well as a top 10 finish in Bern. And you've got to imagine she is going to be motivated to protect her World Cup lead in her home, the Czech Republic. Yep. Ahead of, uh, she is just uh, ahead of Magalie Rochette, of course, of Canada, who was absolutely fantastic for all the American World Cups. Uh, Magalie Rochette did just defend her Pan American Championships jersey this past weekend, and uh, I think that we are expecting to see her head over to Europe and uh, wear the Pan Ams Championship kit once again over there in the men's field. It is being led by Ellie Iserbit. Ellie has won every single round of the UCI World Cup to date. He is just ahead of Toon Ertz, only leading Toon Ertz by 30 points. So Toon Ertz is in the running. However, this weekend, the field is being shook up because Matthew Vanderpoel is entering the uh, Cyclocross World Cup scene. Is he a threat for the overall? Probably not, but he is definitely a threat for every single race that he enters. And as you can tell by this thing that's on Ian's face at the moment, he has not yet lost a race that he's done this uh, cyclocross season. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Flow Bikes is growing out its beards uh, until Matthew Vanderpool loses a bike race. Please join us. Clarification, Ian your is growing <laughs> his beard. <laughs> Michael's getting a little bit of a late start, but I, I, I have faith in him that he will join us in the Vanderbeard. Challenge, um, and I will say Matthew Vanderpool at the European Championships this past weekend. Ellie Iserbit had his best race against Vanderpool so far. I mean, given you know, there's <laughs> there, we only have uh, what one race uh, prior to that, but the Belgian team um, basically sh fired every shot they could at Vanderpool, and it took him until the very last lap to shake Elias a bit. So um, there, there is hope for riders who are not named Matthew Vanderpool, and there is hope that I, I will get to shave my beard before February. But we will see. And following Tabor, let's get into Hama, the second round of the Dave A. Series. 
Yeah, uh, the riders are taking to Hama, which is, of course, in Flanders, Belgium, and this is Flandrian Cross. This is one of my absolutely favorite cycle cross races of the year. It's this really just like, it's a crazy course. They go through the woods and you just have this really abruptly steep, lumpy terrain. Riders have to like kind of make these awkward mo movements to get over these muddy, just like miniature hills. And it creates this really just like tight pack chaotic racing. We saw in, what was it, 2016 or 17, Vis Vincent Bastions and Jens Adams got tangled up in this forest section. They ended up getting into a little bit of a fight, which was pretty entertaining. Uh, the race jury did not think it was entertaining. Both riders got disqualified. But uh, yeah, the terrain that we have in Hama just lends itself to this really aggressive close quarters racing. And I think it is just one of the best shows that we see all year. Um, yeah, Ellie Izerbe is leading Tom Pidcock by 31 seconds in the DVV series overall. And Yara Castroline has an 11 second lead over her teammate Anna Marie Wurst. Again, on the men's side, Matthew Vanderpool will be starting the DVV series with a five minute deficit. This was not an issue for him in 2018-19 season when he lost over four minutes at Copenburg Cross, ended up coming back and beating Toon Ertz for the overall in the Dave Ave series. I think we will see an all-out assault by Vanderpoel in this first round of the Dave Ave series. And yeah, I'm feeling a little bit sorry for anyone who has to line up against him because um, he is just going to be going really fast uh, start to finish. Yeah, and there's going to be no sitting up on the last lap should Matthew Vanderpool be away. He is be going to be trying to claw back every single second that he can all the way to the series finale uh, some six races from now. But this is where it all starts for Matthew Vanderpool, and we are excited to see what he does with it. Of course, if you're in Canada, you can tune into the UCI World Cup in Tabor, live and on demand. And Flandering Cross will be live and on demand for everyone outside of Belgium. Yeah, so please do tune into Flow Bikes for all the cyclocross racing action this weekend. Uh, we'll see you there, and then we'll talk about it afterwards.